what we've got at the moment is the federal government definitely pushing this through and they have authority to assess health and environment. They've set up a regulatory regime, as Judy explained, that doesn't actually look at the problems. And I pointed out to government, I've been in this debate almost or, or around a decade, and um, I pointed out that no one is assessing economics. So to start with, they did say, oh, we are, we are. But states have authority over land use, so we introduced a... Uh, mirror legislation in each state that assesses economics. So when the federal government says, yeah, she'll be right, mate, bring her in, the states then impose the moratoria to say, no, it's an economic risk, we need to assess it. So now the federal is feeding state all pro, pro um, reports saying, oh, the economics will be, will be damned if we don't go that way. But I'll, I'll show you why they're very inaccurate. So really, the, the feds are trying to override the state's responsibility to assess economics. Now, I haven't used one of these. Little I think I... Oh, right. Oh, that would help. OK. <laughs> right, so please visit our website. We have around about 5,000 hits a day. I do all that myself. Okay. Um, and I, I've been a bit um, behind with the news that are on there, but I've got a lot of old articles you can search through. Um, it's just that we're short-handed, so if you know of a, a farm labourer looking for work, that would be handy because the mines gobble them up in West okay. Australia. <clears throat> but uh, we farm over 10,000 hectares, mostly convention well, it's conventional uh, farming, um, and we crop around 6,000 hectares of that, and we have 10,000 sheep. We own and manage one of the largest seed grading factories in West Australia, and we have a previous history of contract crop spraying for around about 20 years. So I'm not your average greeny Luddite, although I am painted to be one. Agropolitically, I'm a national spokesperson and website manager for the Network of Concerned Farmers. Recently, I was the, um, until recently, I was a senior vice president of WA Farmers Grains Council and the WA rep on the Grains Council of Australia on the Policy Council. And for a few years, I was on the, grain, the, the West Australian delegate on the uh, Grain Council of Australia Seeds Subcommittee. I'm very busy doing this. I do this bit simply because I do not like farmers being lied to. And never in my life have I seen them lied to as much as we are being lied to about GM crops. Oops. Yes. Unfortunately, it's led to farmer conflict, which is not nice. We've got farmers thinking they're going to make a fortune out of GM. They're listening to the scientists, investors and the government to get that opinion. On the other side, we have those farmers wanting to grow non-GM. They are listening to consumers, markets and independent economic assessment. So you have a conflict. Hang on, go back. Can GM and non-GM coexist is the problem. We are promised choice. I'll explain why we will not have one. Goodness sake, I'll get used to this soon. <laughs> States have authority to assess if industry is prepared. We are promised choice, they're saying we are prepared. But let's look at the coexistence principles, which farmers are not being shown. It's only because I've been in my positions that I've been able to see it. I've also got leaked documents of the uh, crop management plans, etc., that have allowed me to work out what's happening, what's planned. Non-GM farmers are expected to keep GM out rather than the GM to be contained. So this is your GM farmer. They're not impacted. They just grow right to the fence. The non-GM farmer must provide a buffer zone of whatever you think will keep it out. As Jeffrey explained that Monsanto said, that could be three kilometres. That buffer zone must be marketed as GM. So the non-GM farmer is to try and run a GM and a non-GM supply chain on their own farm. Now we're perhaps one of very few farmers that could do that because ours is 25 kilometres long. But the average person cannot do that. GM canola 
is to take over the existing supply chain. That means wherever canola is delivered, the GM canola can deliver to that. If we are to deliver non-GM canola to the supply chain, we've got to find our own supply chain that will accept it. Oops, and I've just point nine percent. They've also said is okay. ACCC has given the definition that to market as non-GM or GM-free, which is what consumers will be looking for, because you can't look for if it's labelled GM. Oils aren't labelled, so you will be looking for a non-GM or a GM-free label. Legally, that means no contamination anywhere along the supply chain, which everybody knows is impossible. So we cannot provide the non-GM product that you are asking for. Contamination will occur. If you look at pollen, a lot of fuss has been made about the bees, but they forgot to mention that the animals, the pollen stays alive for on three to five days, for, for about three to five days. Out our way, we've got hundreds of kangaroos and emus wandering around the paddocks. Or how, does it, how far does an eagle fly? It will spread. The wind. This is in 2002. Uh, we had winds after swathing. Now, swathing, your canola crop grows up and you cut it down and it dries in the paddock. Otherwise, it sort of tends to fall down a lot. So you then wait and come along once it's dried and you harvest it. Now, it's sitting there in swaths, they call them, and it's like a paddock full of newspapers, waiting for a puff of wind to pick it up and take it off. This is, in that wind, farmers went in to harvest their canola crops and didn't have any. It had blown away, and you can see here where it's actually left the paddock. It's blown over the fence and disappeared. Where did it go? They couldn't really find it. They could find a little bit in the bush and away it went. But um, this is happening over in Canada because it's actually raining. It was reported to be raining in Manitoba of canola because the wind picked it up and dropped it all down on the cities. You've, you can see evidence all the time of, of it moving in the wind. The floods. This is a GM... Uh, trial. We did aerial photos of GM trials and we noticed that the, I think it was South Australia Narracourt. Narracourt was flooded and washed the trials downstream. They didn't tell anybody that. And the neighbours downstream were not happy. And you can see next to waterways where canola pops up all the time because it's nice and light and floats down and pops up all the way along. Remember it's the non-GM farmer stopping all this. How are we going to stop it? Animals. You often see kangaroos digging out seed out of the patch, out of their pouch, sitting in the corner of the paddock, um, going from one paddock to the other. Um, you've got sheep that, that moving around grazing stubbles, and the, and the canola seed, if you graze a canola paddock, will stay inside the sheep and come out as dung three to five days later, and and, and can grow a GM canola plant if you want. And of course, you, you're trading sheep, so you you don't know that the sheep's been grazed on GM when you go to buy it. So you can't keep... This is a non-GM farmer's responsibility to try and stop it. Farm operations. You, you can't even clean out your seed, your seed properly. So if you get a contract harvester or even in your own... Remember, we've got to try and do a GM and a non-GM side <coughs> by side on our own paddock. So if you harvest one crop, you can't do it. About six kilos of seed stays in the paddock even when you do a border clean out. It's a lot of seed. The, and of course all your normal operations. Actually, I'll just go to this operation here. This here is a lupin crop. And then, as I explained, we have a trisling tolerant uh, canola at the moment. It's non-GM, so you plant it and you spray it with trisine and the weeds die, but the, tri the canola crop keeps alive. So 